Okay, we'll go ahead and get the meeting going again. Let's, uh, for the record, let's do a roll call who is in attendance at this time. Rosado? Okay. Etak? Here. Stark? Here. Chancet? Wolf? Here. Silvati? Aye, here. Brown? Here. O'Brien? Callahan? Aye, here. Meitzler? Here. Mueller? Ewer? Here. Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Here. Okay. Per the change in the agenda, we're going to go right on to resolution 17-75-R, which is the awarding the task order number 12 to Alan Peppa, Architects for Government Center Interior Space Planning for an amount not to exceed $97,900. Alderman Wolf, are you going to start us out with that? Sure, I will. This is part of the uh, Comprehensive Conditions Assessment Report um, that was completed on the Government Center in 2015. Um, that report identified and prioritized a number of life safety and building code issues as well as other uh, routine maintenance items. Uh, funds were budgeted in 2016 for modernization of the building elevator, roof safety cable systems, building security upgrades and HVAC modifications and a new fire suppression system for the computer server room. Uh, we're currently in for permit and out to bid on multi-year masonry tuck pointing and window replacement. That starts us off to where we are, and now we're going to talk about the uh, interior space planning. Thank you. Um, so life safety issues are kind of where we started with the building after the conditions assessment report. Council felt that addressing life safety and building code issues should be the top priority, and quickly behind that was the exterior window project and masonry project, which we're currently out for bid on now. Those are the two things. In fact, the built window project kind of drove the first start of things, and then we realized that we had other issues in the building that we needed to, needed to address. So um, we began with looking at life safety issues, and um, Alderman Wolf just read through a list of the things we've already addressed, and the two major ones that are remaining from a life safety standpoint are the main staircase, and I know there's been a bunch of discussion about that at the council level, and egress from the second floor. Um, if you are in the finance department hallway, at nighttime, such as right now. Um, you can't get out, if there's a fire in this staircase here, you can't go north, because that's the police department, those doors are locked. And you can't get out through the mail room, because those are sliding glass doors, which aren't, they're not, you know, not like panic bar doors to get out, and they could be locked, frankly. So there's no secondary means of egress out of that hallway up there. And then we also have some egress issues in the main hallway, um, which were caused by insulation of a couple of doors in the main hallway um, by the art gallery. So those issues we need to address um, in combination with the main staircase. So we've talked about, I know it's been discussed at city council about the main staircase, looking at options to modify it, looking at options to um, you know, make it maybe make it a little safer, but but then we ran into some code issues, and so in the end, I think it was decided that the only way to really make it right was to reconstruct it. Then we began to talk about, well, if we're going to reconstruct it, do we want to reconstruct it in its current location? Obviously, you've all come through the city hall entrance hundreds of times, and when you come in, you're greeted by a staircase four feet away. Um, you really have, you know, you 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 have you kind of it's blunt when you walk in the front door. And right now our receptionist is kind of tucked over to the corner um, back in a hallway closet, basically. So the talk was, okay, so let's reconstruct the staircase maybe in a different configuration to take it away from the front door um, and put it, up, put it along the sidewall there. We talked about that and bring it upstairs. Um, then we also, um, Lane Allen, our architect, also suggested what happens if we move it completely into the space where the receptionist is currently sitting getting it out of the lobby altogether, and it becomes then you know, not an obstruction, and it becomes basically you know, a vertical space in that part of the building. So from a staff perspective, we started talking about where we wanted the receptionist and how we wanted the receptionist to sit in the lobby. Then we started talking about the separation between police department functions and city hall functions. It was noted by the police chief and the command staff that sometimes um, activities occur in the police lobby which maybe aren't fully conducive to City Hall business. Um, and often people will come into the police lobby looking to conduct City Hall business but not knowing really where to go and then you know, going to the police front desk. So they're, they're, we felt as a staff that some sort of separation of police and City Hall business um, might be a good <laughs> thing. 
And then we also began talking about utility billing, which some of you will remember used to be in the Fox River Conference room. Then it was moved upstairs, and we all felt as a staff that we should have some central location for residents to come in who wish to conduct City Hall business and not have to go throughout the building to do so. To maybe centralize and locate all City Hall functions that are generally face public facing functions into one space. So we thought about this concept of bringing utility billing back downstairs again. So with all of that kind of in context, we began having meetings internally with the department heads talking about you know, what, what they needed for their individual departments and how we thought that we may want to you know, make some modifications to make City Hall function better for the public, make it a more secure building. Obviously, we live in a different time now than when this building was first converted to City Hall. Um, it is not uncommon to see people walking through the hallways upstairs and you have no idea who they are because um, they have direct access to the up upstairs hallways. And so we, 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 and then again, separation of those city hall functions from the, from the police side functions. So we began to, to take all those ideas and concepts and um, Lane was helping us then with some original pencil sketches, which obviously then transformed and became you know, refined into what we have here tonight in the phasing drawings, which I presented in your packet and I can go through them with you to try and, try and um, highlight these, these main changes. Um, let me step back out real quick here. We have talked about before in front of city council this idea that the canopy out here, which very nicely states council chambers, and for anyone who wants to come to a council meeting, goes to that canopy and <coughs> pulls on the door and finds the doors locked because you've got to go in through the main entrance. Because the council chamber entrance really isn't the council chamber entrance. And so it's confusing to the public, plus this entrance right here kind of sits behind the landscaping and off to the side. So as you're coming out of the parking lot, it's not really the first thing that catches your eye. So we've talked at City Council before about raising the vis visibility of, of what would become the City Hall entrance. So we've talked about taking out this landscaping altogether, potentially adding some more diagonal parking out there in order to get some parking spaces like directly in front of the door. Um, get some activity in front of the door so that you draw people's attention to the door and begin to make this, this distinction that you're walking into City Hall and if you go north 100 feet, you're walking into the police department, but interior you still have you know, that, that connection, um, but they're separate, separate spaces, but all city functions. All right, so I'm going to go back to this phased drawing. So, so we, we realized that we could not do all these improvements at one time. They're probably going to have to be phased in phase one, maybe phase one A, one B, and then phase two A, two B. I mean, it's going to probably be several years um, of a commitment to, to slowly convert this, this, these spaces. Um, but we wanted to at least present kind of our overall master plan to you and then begin talking. So I'm going to walk you in the doors right here outside city council chamber. So the doors that you would walk in today to go to the building department, the, the doors that say city council chamber, um, both this entrance and the police, the police, the, the current city hall entrance, main lobby entrance, the sliding doors are at the end of their life. They're starting to experience maintenance issues on a, on a, on a somewhat regular basis. They're getting to that point where they're, they're, they're nearing the end of their life. So we, we would probably replicate both entrances having sliding doors, you know, with new sets of doors. Come in this doorway, which goes up the stairs, which maybe many of you walk by and don't ever go up that doorway. That doorway would remain locked and with a, with a swipe um, so that only employees could go through that doorway, basically limited security access, so the public couldn't get up those stairs. The public would have to enter, and then when the public enters this lobby, on the left there will be window glazing so that they can see that they could simply go straight to the left into utility billing. This would become a utility billing space, much like it was. On the right would be this main city hall receptionist desk. Um, so he or she will be sitting at the receptionist, be able to answer anybody's questions and they come in the door. No walls. No walls, basically just a desk. Behind them in this space, and this, this space where I'm pointing to on the, on the drawing is, is this space behind Anthony right here. So this storage area where we currently have tables and chairs, we currently have like the, HVA, um, the HVAC control, the thermostats in there, but the, more importantly the sound controls are in there. Um, so that's that space. And so back to this drawing, the receptionist would sit here, and also, and also in this space right here would, would be the city, city's mail room. 
So this would be the staff's mailboxes, uh, city council mailboxes. This would be where your FedEx and UPS deliveries are made uh, so that the receptionist can then collect and, and accept all those deliveries and have them right in one spot here. Also in this lobby would be seating for um, you know, the general public uh, waiting for either an appointment or waiting outside the city council chambers. And if you want, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll stay on the first floor, but if you wanted to go upstairs, you would see the receptionist and whoever you had a meeting with would you know, tell the receptionist, oh yes, that's John Smith, he knows the building well, you can send him up, I'll meet him at the top of the stairs. Or if it's never who's anyone, someone, anyone who hasn't been in the building, the staff member will come down and escort the person through these stairs. This will become the main public staircase, which is this staircase here, which again, many of you probably don't go into, but right now it's more of a, of a utilitarian staircase mm -hmm. with uh, concrete treads and block walls that are just painted. And we, we will basically take some steps to, to make it a little more pleasing to the public, basically aesthetic improvements in that staircase so that it becomes more of a professional looking staircase to bring people up to the second floor. But again, they will only be able to go up there if the receptionist buzzes them through or if a staff member comes down and gets them. So that'll prevent public from just wandering up on the second floor um, unescorted. So also on this, now in this area, which is currently right behind me here where BATV is, um, this is where community development currently has their plotter and a photocopier. That space will become the storage space, which is currently behind Anthony. So this will become city council storage space and where the sound equipment will go and BATV will still be in there. So that can all go into that space. Where the Fox River room is today, we all acknowledge it's probably a little big for, for the types of conference room that, that it is. And so we're, we're going to slide the Fox River room over into probably, again, a space where many of you haven't been there. There used to be two offices here for planners and a third office for our construction, and construction inspector. But that space can become what we'll call a new conference room. Um, it'll be city council you know, input in all this, but one of our thoughts was because this was the Appleton Manufacturing Company, um, maybe we want to you know, rename, instead of just call it the council chambers, maybe it becomes the Appleton you know, chamber, chambers. And then the conference rooms could become like a model of one of their windmills that they had. You know, the great room could turn into the, to the, you know, the largest model windmill that they used to have. Just something that you know, would catch the public's attention as they come into the historic part of the building. And um, again, instead of just calling it the great room or a conference room or the council chambers, we could give it a little historic flair. Um, also then in this area, this is the current unisex bathroom that will still be off of the police department. This becomes a new bathroom, which ultimately will become just a men's room, <coughs> because in the further phase, there'll be a woman's room that'll be here. Um, and if I'm in the city hall now, I can come all the way down to the elevator and I can go up the elevator. Uh, again, we'll work on security for the elevator, whether it be a swipe or whatnot, in order to control access. And so during the daytime, you'll have access to the elevator, the public can get there. and this becomes, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit, but I wanna, wanna bring you off of the police lobby. This becomes a new women's washroom. So ultimately, like I said, there was a men's and a women's on the city hall side, and ultimately on the police side, they'll continue to be what was a unisex, or maybe we'll designate that as a men's, but a unisex bathroom and a women's bathroom here. One of the statements that was made by the police department is that our lobby is often used for special events on the weekends, and that the line to the restroom can often get very long. So especially a women's, lob women's restroom was needed in the lobby here for, for use by the general public on the weekends. So during the weekends, you know, this door would be closed because City Hall would be closed and the general public could come in through the police lobby. If they had business in City Hall, such as the theater folks, you know, they would be able to go through this door and up, up the elevator. And there'll be a second door here that'll prevent them from going on the City Hall side. Okay. I'll step up the pace a little bit, but I want this is where a lot of the first phase is. Also a big part of the first phase is an expansion out into the police department lobby, which today currently is basically unused space. There's the back hallway, which goes out towards the river walk, and then this space is really unused, and then there's a, actually like a janitor's closet here. So, so by punching through the janitor's closet and utilizing the janitor's closet that, that, that is over here temporarily, um, We'd punch through the, temp the janitor's closet and then create this space for community development, which gives them added room that they need because I stole their space from here. And the police department currently has a computer forensics lab, which sounded very fancy to me and I was very worried about having to move it. 
but it turns out that it's really just basic Cat5 wiring and some PCs and nothing more fancy than that. So it's, it's nothing more than an office space. So their, their computer forensic lab is going to get relocated, and I'll, I'll show you where. And then this back hallway from being here shifts over to here. This way we maintain that critical access out the east, east side of the building, uh, out to the Riverwalk, and it still, still provides direct access to the public into the police department lobby and becomes actually a, a, a lane has a different drawing and a different set of plans, which, which this entrance becomes um, a little nicer than it is today. It's actually a little more befitting of the building, the entrance that he has designed there uh, with a little bit of an arch window on top of it. The diagonal wall can be an arch wall or uh, yep. historical contextual information. So that, that, that gets you back to here. So we stole the, the police, police computer lab and that's going to go upstairs. Part of this phase is a study, and at this point in time, that's all we are going to approve until we figure out what we're getting ourselves into, is a study of this blue area to see what the mechanicals are and to see what the hurdles are to think about turning this blue area into where you are today in the council chambers, where you could look up and you could see the beams, you could see the underside of the wood floor. Again, the public could walk in and really see um, you know, a, a, a historic a space which reflects back to history of the building and be really attractive because I know pretty much everyone who walks in this council chamber, well, not pretty much everyone, I'd say everyone who walks in this council chamber always comments on how beautiful this room is. You know, the post and beam construction with the limestone and the, and the big timbers, it's, it just can't be, you know, replicated. So if it becomes a, a really big hurdle, we, we won't do it in this space, but we're hoping that the study will prove that it would be relatively easy to restore that characteristic to this small blue area and have that in our main lobby. Um, I joke because you go into some other very modern uh, new village halls and you'll find a fireplace in the lobby, which I, I, I always kind of have cringed at, but at least ours could be more reflective of the building that we're in, <clears throat> and it could be our signature feature of, of our city hall. Okay, so that's the first floor, and I'll, I'll kind of quickly go through the second floor because most of it falls under phase two, but I told you that we stole the computer forensic lab from the police department, and that's going to go up here into what currently is the employee break room. The stairs are going to go here, and they're going to steal some room out of that employee break room also to create this basically well, a landing. Now, this, this landing right here where my, my, my hand is is open space now. That's, that's the staircase, but that'll be closed in, and we'll just leave this little bit right here for open space. So that'll be closed in and become a back hallway. On a temporary basis, where the receptionist was and where, thank you, I'm, I'm doing good, um, where the receptionist was and where the back entrance to the police department is, because we're taking the public out from the second floor, and the public really won't be up here, you know, wandering around anymore, we felt that on an interim basis, we probably could do a couple of vending machines and a couple of tables out here. It's really a back hallway lobby that, that, that's not going to be, you know, for the public. If the public does come in in the, in the interim basis, they're going to come up these stairs and go to the great room. They're going to see the mayor. They're going to be in the administrative side. Uh, they really aren't going to be back in this side of the building because there's no purpose for them being back there. So as an interim basis, that's where the, the quote-unquote employee lounge will be on an interim basis until we go into the future phases. Um, we're addressing that uh, egress issue by taking out these sliding doors and putting in a regular door here with a, with a um, panic bar. We're taking out one of the doors in the hallway here, again, to address the egress issue. And then this is all phase two, and I, I won't get into that in much detail tonight because we have other things to, to discuss. But um, phase two basically, oops, I'm sorry. Phase two basically dark, reconfigures this area to move what essentially is the great room now over, over into this space where HR is. It reconfigures HR um, and then creates a new, new mayor's council room. Again, we, maybe we can call it after one of the small windmills that Appleton used to make. Um, you know, it takes some more space for IT, gives them some more space. So we, we, we're trying to think often in the future as to what, what you know, what's what the needs will be, but those, those can all be done as part of a future phase, and I'm going to go back up to, uh, this can also be done as part of a future phase, and that is to take the alderman's room, uh, which right now had been used for executive sessions, and I, I don't, I can't remember the last time we had an executive session in the alderman's room. It's been a very long time. Councils kind of changed their practice to have executive sessions right in the council chambers, so um, we, we were proposing to grab this space and turn it into the employee um, break room because there is already plumbing here to create a little kitchenette right there and um, you know there's already a washroom there as well so with that I'm gonna I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'll grab the lights real quick.
So we are to the phase. Sorry, I'm talking to the microphone. We are to the point in the process um, where we are now recommending uh, task order number 12, which takes these conceptual plans, which as you can see are, are I say, you know, they're a little more than conceptual, but that takes these plans then and creates contract documents from them, uh, knowing very well that um, the costs, and I think if you guys scrolled through your packet, uh, the phase work, phase one work right now, uh, this is estimated around 450,000, and we have 275,000 in the budget. So we, we realize as staff that you can't do everything up here that's depicted in yellow in the 2017 budget, but it's probably a project that won't be fully done in 2017 anyways. I mean, by the time you do a contract document, you're gonna be crossing into the new year and the new budget. Um, so that's something that council um, can consider you know, in the big picture as, as before we award this task order. But staff is aware of the fact that this is going to be a multi-year project that has to be budgeted over time. Um, I'm going to stop there and basically, you know, repeat our recommendation for award of this resolution, but then ask for questions. We have questions. I guess my biggest thing would be, since we know we can't afford to do it all at once, how do you stage some of this? especially when you're going to be moving mechanical systems and HVAC, I think to me is the biggest question because that's to me the biggest problem in this building historically and today has always been the multiple different generations of HVAC and coordination throughout <coughs> every part of this building. Are we going to try and solve some of that when we do this? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to make a couple of statements. Um, first of all, over the last couple of years, we have made really pretty great strides in solving our HVAC issues. Uh, we had a study done as part of the condition assessment report, and we've had a couple of rooftop units, I think three of the rooftop units now since that report came out have failed and, and, and we've had to replace. And every time we've had those replaced, we've kind of taken that broad study and done a more detailed study of the areas and determined you know, what, the, what the needs are for those individual areas. So we are making progress and will continue to make progress on the HVAC side. It's not like it was five years ago. We have made, we've made good progress. Um, with respect to phasing, and for the most part, generically speaking, for the most part, we're not going to get into a lot of mechanical work because a lot of, I'll use utility building as an example there on the screen, a lot of what we're doing is within the confines of spaces which are already office spaces. Okay. You know, we're taking this, it's going to become a conference room, but it's already an office space. So it's already heated, it's already cooled, there already is electric there. Now certainly there's some interior partition walls which we'd have to take down, but the big, the big um, conditioning of the spaces, we're not looking at big hurdles there, because a lot of these spaces are already being used for the same uses they're going to be used for in the future. Does that make sense? Okay. I think and yes, we'll have to do a 1A and a 1B type phasing as budgets go. But. You want to come um, up to the microphone? Lane Allen of Allen and Peppa Architects. The other way of thinking about this is unlocking the potential of the building by bringing utility building down and, you know, moving things around. All of a th all of a sudden, more uh, things start to work properly, and and so there's a lot of and that's why we really just need to do phase one so that. You know, like this, just everything, one thing affects another. And so it's been pretty well strategized. And I think that also correlates with your uh, phasing of, of cost items. And that doesn't mean that you can't have one contract document, one bid document, one permit document. How you phase the work and pay it out over time is really a means and methods and coordination with city staff. But in terms of how I would get my work done and then I can course also refine and, and clarify the, the 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 individual scopes of work so that like on the on the package that's going around we call the scope of work one for the east side and you know and how the city staff and and the contractors work together to to get the work done in the course of the manner but at least they understand the entire picture give me a chance to drink so just a clarify question here. Yeah. The 97.9 that this task order is for, that's coming out of the 275, and you said the total actual work is looking at a total of 490,000? 
Is that corner and 50. Yes, 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 and yes. Okay, so just to make sure we're understanding then, um, if 97.9 is coming out of the 275, we're looking at roughly 180 towards phase yep. one yep. for this year, which means budget. 2018 budget. We have to, if we're committing to this, look at roughly another 300,000. Roughly around 300,000. Yeah, you're at 275 this year. So you're roughly around the same value again next year. For 2018. Yep. And that's to complete phase one. <coughs> so just towards mm -hmm. budget planning. Mark? So which parts of phase one would you be planning on doing <laughs> this year? OK, so we would do construction documents and then get it out to bid. And that's a means, and that's like Lane just said, that's a means and methods. We will, we will have to figure out how, again, we wouldn't award a bid without all of your knowledge. You all have to award the bid. So ideally, considering that we start budgeting in September, October, and by the time he completes contract documents and we get things out to bid and back, we're going to be definitely all of September, October, if not later in the year before we are ready to award a contract. At that point in time, you will have had the opportunity to discuss the 2018 budget. And in that whole context, you could award a contract that spends the re remainder of the 2017 dollars knowing that you already have 2018 dollars coming. The, the further statement is, it's, it's like one of those puzzles you used to play with a kid and you gotta unlock one piece and do another. So I think it's gonna be pretty self-evident on what pieces are going to, are gonna go first. And that will have to be clear, clearly stated in the contract documents so that the payouts are according and there and you know like of course when you do construction work you like to get the plumbing you know the groundwork done and then do all the finishes at the end so you know there's there's a, a a trick to you know help the contractor be as efficient as possible anybody else i've got a comment Dave. um I, I i like what i see I mean, I think, you know, as you've said, the council's kind of committed and commented on the life safety issues, and certainly there's a lot of this stuff that needs to happen. Um, and I really like, as far as design goes, I, I like opening up the lobby area, moving the lobby area over and opening that up so we can see the building. Um, and I've always thought that the police lobby is a lot, as you mentioned, a lot of unused space. So you put a lot of thought into that, and you and staff and Aunt Lane. Um, one comment I do have is I'm hoping that maybe you could take a look at the main entrance, what's going to be the main entrance, the south, oh, sorry. The south but, vestibule, it's yep. called. Um, as you mentioned, if somebody comes in and they go to the receptionist and you say, okay, you can send them on upstairs, the way it's laid out now, Lane, you basically have to send them back out into the vestibule. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't clear about there's, that. I'm sorry. There's a door right here. If you look on the drawing, and it's not very clear right here, but there's I, Yeah, a, I saw that, but it looks like it's going into a closet, so I didn't know what you yeah, were thinking no, it's, over it's, there. It's kind of tough on this drawing, but the, the intention is that from the lobby, you would go straight, there'd be two doors into the base of that staircase, okay. the lower landing of that staircase. So you wouldn't be sending them back outside you send them all the vestibule. Yeah, you'd send them through that doorway and then up, up the stairs. Yeah. yeah. And I, I understand how you can make the 2017 and 2018 budget work, and. Mm -hmm. It's going to be phased out that way, and we're running out of time in 2017 anyway. Mm -hmm. So, well, we've been working on other projects in 2017. Really, the big one is the window one. So that that's yeah. that's going to and Public Works. You guys not part of this building, but we did a project out in Public Works already, and we're continuing with that project. So, and you're going to I forget now the the window replacement and the tuck pointing. I know that was going to be phased, but certainly you're going to look at doing those areas that you're also doing the phase one of the interior. Right, we need. I mean, to, you wouldn't want to, to be replacing windows in an area that you're not, and then a year later, you know, a year later to, after you've done phase one of the building, come in and replace the windows. Uh, remember, the window replacement will have I don't want to say minimal, but it also is going to have some of minimal minimal impact on the interior of the building. Yeah. We are we are not stripping off the drywall on the entire exterior wall. We're just we're just really only doing one foot either side of the window to 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 get the window in, and then patch it up. So, to answer your question. I don't know yet that if we're going to do the east side this year, we need to do the south facade and the west facade. Right. I don't know that we'll be able to do both of those facades in 2018, just from a dollars and cents standpoint. Um, 
that aside, I guess it goes to the to the you know the city's reserves and how much you would want to spend out of reserves for such a large project. But we need to, to time the south and west so that remember we're using lime uh, mortar. That's why we're starting on the east side this year because we'll probably be out to construction during the heat of the summer, and the east side of the building is obviously the coolest side of the building. In future years, we'll be, where we'll be able to control the timing a little better, we want to get on this south facade probably, hopefully, in April or May of 2018 and get the south facade done, and then maybe from a dollar and cent standpoint, we have to wait till 2019 to do, to do that west facade. Again, that can be a council discussion as to how, much, how you want to phase your dollars um, in order to do that. <clears throat> It's interesting that, it's interesting that um, I don't think the interior and the exterior, there's not really a, as much overlap. It, it's mostly, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how to limit the disruption of the staff. Right. But uh, since this is the focus of the first floor, and you can kind of see it's on the, it, the, the, the two don't really affect each other that much. So I, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that they don't. But we're very conscientious about, uh, uh, you know, how we're going to limit interrupting the staff in the course of doing the windows and you know that's going to be a, a, a definitely a means and methods coordination you know thing with the windows okay. Okay, anybody else any other comments yeah I just want to I'm certainly I've been aware of what Lane and the committee have been doing here and I have no problems with what they're doing I the only thing I, I have a moment of pause about is I was on the call with the mayor's caucus this afternoon we got into you know where we're going with the state of Illinois budget and there continues to be high concern that they're going to go after our local government distributing fund and you know that's right now for Batavia that's about two and a half million dollars and I got to believe some of that money would be maybe some of what we would be using here to do some of this and I just want us to move forward very cautiously because I'm not sure we have a deep pocket to spend on stuff like this at this point moment as Maybe we thought we did. Gary, can you address the building fund again? <clears throat> the building fund. I mean, how much of this can we take from there? Well, the council designated two hundred seventy-five thousand for this project this year. Okay. There's other funds in that building fund because we've identified the window project, and I, I don't have that piece of the budget in front of me. I can pull it up on our website if you want me to. Um, I can do that if you need me to, but but yeah, there's there's other funds in that building fund. It's not a two hundred seventy-five thousand dollar fund. It's it's a larger than that fund. Uh, but I don't have it off the top of my head. But the contract that you're asking for approval on tonight, or a resolution, is is basically for design and and planning. Yes. Right. Correct. So and and you need to have the entire design and plan done before you start expending money. So it's timing's probably pretty good to get that going, and if something does happen with the state mayor, I guess you know we just can't go as far as we want to go. It's the capital project budget. Okay. Yeah, that's I, one of my can I chirp in? concerns with the, the the phasing of it. You know, if we've got the money already budgeted for a certain part of it, and we can complete that and not disrupt the services we provide or the employees right. that we have and we get to that point then we say whoa the state just you know took away half our LGDF can we live with it that way Nick I, I was going to agree and say obviously we can move forward in steps there's a lot on here that are nice to have and not need to have what came to mind for me is our discussion over the last four years for me saying we need to sit down and prioritize what's important because over the last few months I've heard a lot about we need, we need funding for this and that and the, the wastewater and we need to somehow um, separate these nice to haves and make sure we got the, the need to haves covered before we move ahead with some of this stuff. But I'm okay with the taking this step and seeing how things Proceed. Well, and I think, too, that this is something that over the years that I've been on the council, as we've moved things around inside this building, some of them have made sense to me, some of them haven't, where we've moved different offices back and forth or changed things around. And I think to try to lay it out to make it work better for our employees and work better for the public 
is really, to me, the best thing we can do with it, not just maintaining it and putting windows in and doing the other things we need to do life safety wise, but also making it a very usable building. I mean, I think of the other cities around here that have spent millions, you know, $20 million to put up a city hall and an administration building or something for their police department. We're not in that boat. So I think that, you know, as long as we're cautious on the money we spend, I think we're doing the right thing. Marty? Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And I, I especially like what you're saying about, you know, the priorities as the part of it. And that's what I'm taking away actually from all of this. It's maximizing the space that we have, making it more efficient, and the the layout of it, of putting the core features that the public is going to come here for are all about maximizing their time and making all of the other, the things that we try to make priorities of uh, business friendliness or making it easier for the process. That's been a large priority of what we've wanted to do. And this, as a building redesign, accomplishes part of that while also addressing all the other things such as safety, which is, in this day and age, we're seeing way too many things that we just can't take for granted anymore. It's got to be at the first and foremost thought with, with that part of it. So if we're making it safe while also there's so much dead space, like you're saying, that it's just ridiculous to have space that's not being used when we've got people crammed in that can't find their way. We've seen it all too often, just people walking around have no idea where to go, and they're wandering around in empty spaces, that all of this does, as a priority, does fit well. Um, but what do we do if things, the bottom falls out? That should be a major concern, but I think this step is what we've started the conversation for the past few years of trying to figure out those goals where we accomplish those things that we need to accomplish while keeping in the back mind that it could all go south tomorrow. I, I think we all know that it could, but we also can't live in that fear of never getting nothing done because, oh wait, no, that's exactly what they're doing down, down south. So we need to still continue to do the things that we need to do that make sense, that are important to our residents, important to the business community, uh, try to figure out what we need to do, take care of what we need to do with what we have, um, and just keep moving forward. Very briefly, you guys can see it. I don't need to run through the numbers, but those are the numbers in the capital budget for City Hall. Um, window project, the roof cabling we're working on this year, um, uh, additions to the access control system will be some more panic buttons, which we're currently working on getting installed. And then here's a 275 for the building renovations. Thank you. Isn't there a building fund, though? Aren't I recalling? That there, well, there is, and that's that. This and is, that's the that's the expenditures out of the building fund, and then there's. Uh, so what's the total in the fund? Is it a couple million? Let me let me see. It's a peggy question, but it's right up here. There's the revenues and proposed budget, and I'm trying to find where like the reserves would be. Because we've just started building that. I don't know that I can answer your question very well, Lucy. I, 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 I'm, okay. This is the revenues that come into the fund. You know I where it is? I thought we'd been building it right here. for a while. I'm sorry. No, it's right here. Okay. I'm just on the wrong page. So surplus and revenue is projected at the end based on that expenditure is still 332000 Okay. Sorry, I was just on the wrong page. Wait. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody care to make a motion on uh, resolution 1775-R? So moved. Second. Motion by Callahan, second by Sarone. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I think we should talk about it because I think it's very important for the public to understand what we're doing down here. Yep. Okay, so this will go to the next Regular. council meeting. Next council meeting on the 19th, I recall, and then uh, regular agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lane. Okay, next item then is the approval of the 2018 calendar. Alderman Atek. All right, well, 
We have the meeting schedule um, proposed uh, in front of us for 2018. Um, our city council meetings are the first <coughs> and third um, Monday nights of every month unless there's a holiday and then it will be on Tuesdays. And uh, we will meet as COW every Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. So uh, and plan com and commission meets the first and third Wednesdays. Are there any questions? I, d I did not calculate how many meetings <laughs> total days. I haven't yet either, but I will. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll look forward to that. Um, <laughs> are there any questions? Um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the 2018 uh, city council and committee and commission schedule calendar? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. It's approved. Okay. <clears throat> so I guess that needs to go on the regular agenda so I can announce how many meetings there are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right, next item is Ordinance 17-40, which is approving and authorizing the acquisition of real property, extinguishing the driveway easement benefits, benefiting uh, 109 East Wilson Street. And Alderman Atec, that's yours also. It is mine, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Alora because she's living and breathing this. Congratulations <laughs> for making it happen. Thank you. This is uh, the last remaining obligation that the city had in terms of the land acquisition for the redevelopment site for the One Washington Place project. Um, this is pursuant to the RDA between the city and One North Washington LLC. And just to reiterate that this is a project that's going to be comprised of 186 one and two bedroom apartment units, a 350 space public parking garage and nearly 15,000 square feet of commercial space. It's expected that the project is going to generate more than $700,000 in new tax revenue. Um, and it's located within the newly created TIF 5. So there are still um, 23 and a half years, I'm sorry, 22 and a half years remaining on that TIF. Um, Article 2.02 .02 of the RDA required the city to obtain a release or otherwise extinguish the rights to the driveway easements that were benefiting certain uh, properties adjacent to the redevelopment area. And the acquisition of this property is for the second of those. And after some very uh, lengthy negotiations, the owner of the property located at 109 East Wilson Street agrees to extinguish his rights to the driveway easements. And uh, that's on the following terms. Um, there actually was no request for parking spaces that are part of the new public parking garage, which um, as you may recall, in order to extinguish the rights to the other easement that was adjacent, adjacent to the redevelopment area, that required us to give some rights to that property owner for uh, four spaces, which were located in the public parking garage. In this case, um, the property owner asked that the city reserves two parking spaces at the art stop parking lot for the benefit of the owner. Um, and that's only during business hours designated as eight o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. The city will also grant to the, the owner of that property a landscape and pedestrian access easement in replacement for the driveway easement previously held um, and also an easement for the purposes of maintaining his building. Also, the business and residents of 109 East Wilson Street will be provided access to the community garbage corral that will be located in uh, part of the public parking garage. And um, lastly, the city has agreed to um, pay an amount of $125,000 um, to the property owner in exchange for the extinguishment of these rights. Um, it's not written in the agreement, but the property owner did share with us that he has um, plans to improve that building, um, both to the exterior facade of the building, he intends to restore that to its uh, historic true facade, and then also to um, make improvements both on the interior of the building, but also to add some uh, shop-like windows 
to the east side of his building, which also would make that um, pedestrian walkway in between the buildings far more attractive space. Um, so the budget impact is that the city has sufficient funds in its general fund reserve account to meet the financial obligations of these proposed terms. And so staff recommends that the Committee of the Whole recommend approval to the City Council of Ordinance 17-40, approving and authorizing the acquisition of real property, extend, extinguishing the driveway easement, benefiting 109 <coughs> East Wilson Street. Are there any questions? Comments? <laughs> Would anyone like to make a motion? I, you know, Lucy, just for the pub, since we are on TV, I think so the public understands why there's no questions. This is something that the committee's been working on with staff for a very, very long right. time. Yes. So that's the reason why we, there's no questions. Absolutely. We've talked about it many times. Yeah. Yes. And may I add? Yes. Um, although Alderman O'Brien is not here tonight, he contacted me today to say that he would like me to let everyone know that he is in favor of approval of okay. the ordinance. Thank you. Would someone like to make a motion to recommend to City Council the approval of ordinance number 17-40 approving and authorizing the acquisition of real property, extin extinguishing the driveway easement benefiting 109 East Wilson Street in Batavia, Illinois? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. All right, so that goes on to City Council. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about that. I think it should go on the regular agenda. I think it should also. <laughs> okay. Item number 10, resolution 17-06R, authorizing execution of a task order number six with WBK Engineering LLC for the North Dam signage and lighting plan in the amount of $13,600. Alderman Wolf. Let me get that up here. Hold on a second. <laughs> um, this is... I guess I'll just turn this one over to Gary. He's already up there. This is going to be for dam signage and lighting. Not one of my favorite subjects. I had sent correspondence to city council um, regarding a letter which the city had received from the IDNR talking about issues pertaining to dam ownership and, and other items at that time which were being discussed. So it was after that letter, um, that we elected to pull the item from last night's city council meeting and then bring this item forth tonight to the committee meeting to, for discussion. Um, this is a resolution which was brought to you actually, I believe, back in January um, to present, basically have WBK Engineering and, 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 and prepare, have WBK Engineering prepare a signage and lighting plan for the <coughs> North Batavia Dam. And some of the questions that have come out of previous council meetings, and I haven't been at the first two discussions, somehow I timed other meetings actually on those evenings, Prairie State actually. Um, one was why, why are we hiring an outside consultant? Why can't our in-house engineers um, design signing, signage and lighting? And I referenced in this, this updated memo, and I believe I referenced in my other, or at least the, the other memo referenced it, there was a study done by the IDNR in 2007 of waterways and low head dams. And as part of that study, they created some conceptual signage plans for all the dams. Um, and those conceptual signage plans were created using standards from other states and using other sources as well, and were intended to then be the basis for the state of Illinois to develop their own signage and lighting standards which to the best of my knowledge I have yet to find and I have, I have never had anyone confirm that the state never adopted those standards. It was 2007, kind of things fell apart at the state after that time. So to the best of my knowledge, the state of Illinois has no official lighting and signage standards for their dams. And so one of the reasons for utilizing a consultant is to utilize kind of their more broad experience than we have because they deal with dams and waterways on a regular basis where we do not. And they will also then have that professional liability and professional responsibility to put together a plan, present it to the state, and that's where 
if we can get the state's buy-in on the plan and the state's concurrence that the plan is a good plan and they're willing to give us you know their sign off and a permit then we we've kind of hopped over that hurdle of 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 acceptance and and what are we basing this plan on we can turn around and say yes the state of illinois may not have any set standards but we gave them the plan they reviewed the plan they approved the plan therefore you know we're utilizing that plan to implement signage and lighting and so that helps with a liability issue with respect to the with respect to the city. Um, so that's really the scope of what they're going to be working on is signage and lighting. They'll be working with our electric utility, obviously, um, you know, as to how how, how lighting could be implemented and, and, and coordinated with our infrastructure. And this ultimately would then have to go out for you know implementation. But that would be a a, a future or a separate item and a separate. Um, separate amount of money but that's not what that's kind of beyond tonight tonight is the planning phase of signage and lighting plans submittal to the state for their permit also submittal to the army corps hopefully the army corps will say yes you're working adjacent to the waterway and possibly wetlands but all you're doing is installing signs so you won't need a permit but we won't know that until the army corps tells us that so that's also a possibility so with that i will see if anyone has questions does anybody have any questions? Marty? I just had uh, Brent Larson was following this discussion um, online, or actually on BATV, mm -hmm. and he had some questions as it, we know that the DNR installed the buoys. Do we know the timing? One of his questions was, do we know when the timing that they actually do that? And can we find out if they can do it earlier next year? Because he's involved with the uh, Mid-America Canoe Race. Mm -hmm and they want to practice earlier, and if they have them out by April, it gives them a better chance. Um, and then the other one was related to signage around there. Would, would the canoe portage also be signed as a part of this, or could it be separately? I know that the mayor addressed the, the kind of the poor condition that it's in right now, and I know that you've been addressing that with the Parks Department. But maybe that's something, I don't know if it would be part of this or that we probably could design a sign for ourselves as far as the, the portage for that, it all related to the canoeing and what people are actually using it for. Uh, we would I, I, be happy to look into those two yeah, things. Yeah, I could answer actually by both of those questions. Um, unfortunately, I have not heard back from the woman who is in charge of the operations section at the IDNR. I heard back from another person at the IDNR who confirmed that the buoys were put out by the IDNR, but the person who actually is in charge of the section that put out the buoys, I have not heard back from. So I, I will try and follow up with regards to dates when they, when they can be deployed and whether they can be deployed as early as, as April. I will, that's a state question that I will follow up on. Right. Um, I think I said in my correspondence to you that, that, the, that the state puts out the buoys as a protection of the waterway over which they have responsibility for. With regards to the portage, this scope does include um, signage, and because portage is considered a safety feature of the dam. the dam. So if you're going to put up signage which says to people, warning there's a dam, danger, avoid the dam, then if I'm in a, in a canoe, I, I need to say, OK, so what do I do? <laughs> and that's where, that's where there will be signage which says, go here. This is where you portage. And um, one of the gates to the portage is, is, is also included in here. And, and yes, as the mayor has been working with uh, the physical concrete slow openings work as well. So the portage is, is, is connected to this project, although it also has to be a separate project too. So Great, thank you. Yep. I guess I'll just raise my you know, questions. Is I don't understand why we have to put signs out there when the state of Illinois does not require us to nor do they have, re, you know, recommended plan that's out there that fits the waterways. You know, if they haven't come up with a plan, why are we going to submit something to them that's not required by them? Our insurance company is, if we want to get insurance to protect our liability, our insurance company is requiring it. I think that kind of sums it all up. This isn't the state of Illinois. This isn't anybody but our insurance carrier to protect us from liability. Those mean old insurance companies. I know. I mean, but it's, it, I mean, it totally makes sense to me. 
It makes sense to me, and Marty, maybe you jump in on this one. It makes sense to me that if we want insurance, we have to comply with the requirements, but <coughs> there are no requirements. So that's what doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Well, I, the, uh, what, specifically, what the insurance company has asked us to do is to have the dam inspected. Mm -hmm. And then we had the dam inspected, and that resulted in recommendations, which they require us to implement the recommendations. And the recommendations are that we um, put signage and lighting on the dam. And, and I fully I, I get that. Once, once we're made aware of it, and this is the part that I take that we can't ignore it when it's brought to our attention. But going to kind of the other question, dam's been there for billions of years, possibly. Nobody seems to know. <laughs> but why did this never come up before? I mean, I, I'm under the opinion that we've got to address it because they're now bringing it to us to address. No. So, um, we asked them if they would insure us against liability. Um, the Peggy Colby, Gary Holm and myself have identified this as a significant potential risk and one that could cause the city to incur very high dollars in damages. And therefore, when we had our insurance renewal this year, we asked the insurance company, would you uh, provide us with a rider on our insurance that covers liability associated with the dam? And they said, yes, if if you have your dam inspected and you implement the recommendations that are uh, required by that inspection and you continue to do that on an annual basis, have your dam inspected, um, then we will insure you against your liability. So the reason why it has not been done heretofore is because we've just had accepted the risk of liability ourselves. Could you clarify, Laura, what, when you say you have the dam inspected, what are they inspecting? Are they inspecting the physical construction, the physical status of the dam, or are they inspecting the signage and the lighting that would be set forth as a standard? All, all of the above. So they have performed an inspection. WBK has already performed an inspection of the dam, both from a structural standpoint, a functional standpoint, and a safety standpoint. So that's already been done. Um, so in, the, in, in this structural inspection, mm -hmm. What kind of report do we get out of that? I mean, it's a report that says it's not safe? Uh, I've got the report, and I, Chris Warren, I had forwarded that to City Council, and if I haven't, I will gladly give it to you. But I, uh, and I'm, you know, it's I'm a just report which says that, it's a report which says that the dam needs work because the dam is in poor condition. Yeah. I, you know, I, you guys all know how I feel. I'm not going to keep on going on about this. I'm going to vote no for this. I'm going to vote no for everything that's got anything to do with the dam other than protecting our pond. Um, I just think that we're going to continue to dig ourselves into a deeper and deeper hole with this. When we have an inspection on it and they say it's not safe in order to insure it, which we've now recognized that we need to insure it because we've recognized that there could be a problem. Now do we have to spend $5 billion to rebuild the dam to bring it back into the condition that the report says? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that because these are all waters that we haven't traveled in. And, the years and, that and, Marty's mentioned, but I just I see us digging ourselves into a deeper and deeper hole with this thing. And Dave, I mean, Dave does bring up a good, a really good point on that. I mean, signage is signage is one thing, but do we know that they've said, as part of the recommendation, that due to the catastrophic failure of this, you could be liable, so that you either must fix it or you must take it out? Have they given us any indication or? I mean, they could because they could say, yeah, we're not going to insure this right. because of the condition. It's been and several months since I read that report, but I, I don't recall any verbiage in that report right. speaking of catastrophic failure. No. And, and, and it, it, it's a slow, painful death. But we have to have a report done every year, an inspection and a report done every year for no, insurance. So. Regardless of what the inspection report says or what the insurance company says to us, the state the Army Corps of Engineers is not going to allow us to rebuild the dam. It we can repair the dam. Yeah. Right. Yes, we, we, yeah. can, we can repair the dam. I mean, to return the dam to a repaired condition. Yeah. But that, I think that's exactly what Dave's point is, that we don't want to 
we don't know what kind of can of worms we would get if they're if they're saying, well, you now to get insurance, you either must repair it or you must take it down. But that Since was not we, a recommendation of right, the report. But, Next year. But I think but that's next Dave's year, point. Or the year after. So the year after, we could return to the same condition that we're in today, which is that we're not insured for any risk whatsoever, mm -hmm. whether it be because the dam breaks and people uh, receive damage because of the, the dam breaking and failing, nor today are we insured against the risk of somebody wandering in dancing on those slippery rocks like we saw when we were out on our walk out on that peninsula um, kids playing out on those rocks and slipping and falling into the boil of the dam so we're also not insured against that today don't we have general an, an umbrella covering us against any trip anywhere i mean did we have to specify dam or was our original policy said we cover you anywhere but the waterways. We don't list the dam as something that we own, ah. so mm -hmm. we're not covered Full for circle. it. Mm -hmm. And taking three steps back, City Council met, Park District Board met, the outcome of those meetings was that the community sentiment was we want to save the depot pond. Staff was directed to work with the Park District on looking at the dam, looking at ways to save the depot pond which kind of was what started this whole ball rolling. And that's kind of, kind of where we started down the path. Because mm -hmm. the dam today, as we all know, we can all stand out there and look, the dam is in a deteriorated condition from what it was in the 1970s when it was repaired. Mm -hmm. And we can all just imagine that 30 years from now, the dam will probably continue to be in a further deteriorated condition if something is not done. So at some point in time, if we want to truly preserve the depot pond, we need to do something with the dam. I have a question about what this insurance potentially covers. Mm -hmm. So if the dam fails and, it, and there's no longer water in front of the people in the depot who live in front of the depot pond, and they decided to sue the city for not maintaining the dam at, at a level that they think it should have been maintained, would the insurance cover that? Would the insurance cover, you know, if somebody, you know, slips on the rocks and, and falls into the boil and dies. What does the insurance policy actually give us in terms of peace of mind? Because, you know, that's, I guess that's the question I would have. I'm confident that the discussions that we had with the insurance company, we were worried more of the latter risk, mm -hmm. the loss, that injury, injury or loss of life, okay. as opposed to damage to property. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I can't answer confidently about the uh, the loss to property. Uh, Gary, do you have any thoughts in that regard? No, but I, I agree with you. The, the focus was on personal safety and mm -hmm. someone being hurt or killed at the day. Right. And that's why when, when I'm deciding to support this, it is because of, I'm understanding what they're talking about, the the specific risk that they're talking about, which is the boil, the, mm -hmm. the dam itself. And we're not talking about people wading in off the shore and slipping and falling at that part. It is a known hazard. Mm -hmm. um, it is a higher risk known hazard than someone slipping off. So when you're making these calculations, you don't, you're not going to have signage all up and down because you could slip and fall mm -hmm. off of the side bank but because of demonstrated that there is a higher risk and a more likelihood that you should take steps to, uh, to mitigate your risk, which is in this case, the notification via signage that there is a larger risk for you at this place than down here. And when you're, when you're assessing those things all together, um, that's why you would put the signs there uh, instead of every five feet down the line because you can't protect from every single eventuality mm -hmm. but those known spots for mitigating risk is what all insurance is is just to make sure that you're covered for not every eventual risk but the potential likelihood and that we took steps uh, to mitigate them. You don't want me to make my normal comment about insuring against things here. 
Alderman Callahan, what you just said is, is essentially what is exactly written in reports, which I read concerning fatalities at like the Kankakee Dam, and that, that exact same verbiage that, that they needed to identify the hazardous area and, and just draw the t public's attention to the fact that that area was higher hazard than normal. Right. And that was like their responsibility. And, and that's where having been an arbitrator, having facts before me, you've got to weigh the, the who had the greater duty. Mm -hmm. in those situations and you know the public doesn't have a duty to do anything other than walk and go about their married lives but we knowing the risks it's on us to make sure that we say to Joe public who is just out there walking hey be careful now if they choose <coughs> to ignore that that's still on them but you then took affirmative steps to uh, try to prevent it and that's what we are supposed to do under the conditions of why you get a policy. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anybody care to make a motion on resolution 1706-R, approval of task <coughs> order number six with WBK Engineering for signage and lighting plans for the North Batavia Dam for an amount not to exceed $21,100? So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Callahan, second by Stark. Roll call. Please. Callahan? Aye. Meitzler? Aye. Mueller? Absent? Ewer? Aye. Cerrone? Aye. McFadden? Aye. Rosado? Absent? Stark? I'm sorry, ATEC? Aye. Stark? Aye. Chanzit? Absent? Wolf? No. Salvati? Aye. And Brown? No. Motion carried. Motion's carried. But it will be on the regular agenda due, due to the no votes. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one is resolution 17-76-R, authorizing execution of a contract with Carl Walker Incorporated in an amount of $46,000 to provide parking consultant services for one Washington Place parking structure. Alderman Wolf. Thank you. Um, this is uh, for a consultant for the parking structure that we're going to be eventually taking ownership of in Washington Place. Rahat? It's so um, one Washington Place, <coughs> as, as uh, Laura mentioned, that it's going to be a two-story public, par public parking facility uh, for 350 vehicles. And um, the staff has been talking for a few months about entry, exit, how the parking um, uh, configuration is going to be wayfinding and all those things and we have been um, <clears throat> lack of a better word uh, battling among each other like Scott Haynes me and Gary like we have been brainstorming a lot of these things and and we realized that we don't have the expertise of building parking structure in the city so we, we talked and we said maybe a, a somebody who has uh, experience because we are investing such a big amount of money in, in this structure, bring in somebody who can help us with all those things that they, they do on a daily basis. So with that, I, I reached out to uh, the city of Naperville Engineering because they just built a parking structure, uh, similar uh, one that we are trying to build and asked them how did they uh, proceed with the design um, considerations and construction. So they, they recommended Carl Walker, uh, uh, the company, they said they are great. I think that their contract was around $100,000 and, and he said uh, pretty much like that's the best $100,000 that they spent because Carl Walker uh, designed these things and they built these things throughout the United States. So they can easily catch, you know, some of the things that we are looking at. Like one of the thing is, you know, we are going to have uh, like a garage door coming down, you know. So is that something that we should look at or not? You know, how how is the garbage going to be taken out or picked up? So some of those things they have a lot of experience with lighting, uh, the the you know some of the structural numbers that they they will be proposing. The Carl Walker can quickly look at those and and tell us that whether those things make sense. They said. Um, Carl Walker probably saved them a lot of money through their um, expertise and, and, and help. So that's why we, we kind of talked, uh, Gary and Laura, and, and we reached out to Carl Walker and asked them to give us a proposal. <clears throat> Apparently, I think Shodin uh, was probably kind of working, started working with Carl Walker 
to provide uh, their design services, but then I think it didn't work out with them, so uh, showed in contractor with somebody else. So Carl Walker is very comfortable. They looked at you know the, the initial design plan that Shodin has proposed to us and, and looked at it and they kind of estimated how much time they will, they will spend in, in looking at the design and also during the construction. You know, some, sometimes when they are doing big ports, you know, come and help us with the construction observation too. So they are proposing $46,000 to, to provide all the services. Um, that's, that's, that's what their assumption is at this time. And, and we, we staff, looked at it, and all the head department heads looked at the proposal, and we thought uh, for the amount uh, of money that we are gonna spend in this parking garage, $46,000 is probably well worth spend uh, on a consultant who is very uh, well versed in designing and building parking garage structures. Anybody have any questions? Marty? Uh, Ryan Wagner, who's a resident, um, he's an engineer during some of the public hearings that we had on uh, the planning for this garage. He offered some suggestions for different types of way things uh, could be done. I don't recall specifically what it was, uh, but it related to the materials and the way that it was constructed, went to uh, cleaning and uh, future cost savings opportunities in, in the future. Uh, do, will they be looking for those very things? He, he brought that in as like one point, and they're going to be bringing a whole bunch of things. But I would like to make sure that a consultant that we hire has a, as good of an eye as a resident is about making sure that they're looking for those opportunities to uh, for future cost savings. And that's one of the things, if you look at that proposal, they said they will be looking at uh, particularly at long range maintenance cost, how can we reduce those? That's what their, their main expertise is gonna be uh, during the design process. And, and obviously there will be construction services. So that's what, that's what they're gonna focus on. Do you think that the, the fact that Shodin had hired them and then not used they, them or? No, I don't think they hired them. They were, you know, during, during any, any Big project. They they talk to a lot of their okay. sub consultant, you know. And okay. so there's no bad blood or no, anything between no, them. So no. that shouldn't be a problem. In the, and because I don't think it's a problem to have somebody from the outside looking no. over it at this to see if it's really going to get what we want out of it, especially on the maintenance side of it. I I bring that up because as soon as I call uh, Tori Thompson, who is their managing director, he's like, Oh, I know about this project. I'm like, <laughs> How do you know about this project? He's like, Because. You know, we, we were interested in, in providing the designing services. But there are obviously other, other parking consultants like them uh, who provide similar services too. Okay. Will this be paid through the TIF? <clears throat> yes, it will be paid through the TIF. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mark? I guess my question would be, Shodin's got their group that's gonna say, here's how you, we wanna build a parking garage and then these guys come in and they say, uh, you should really do it this way, and it raises the price by half a million dollars. I don't know, just throw it out there. Who's absorbing that? Yeah. But, but, but we are also building something on top of the parking structure, so even though we, you know, I think, provide comments or changes that has to be compatible with the, you know, what's going on the top. So, so yes, let's say, it, <laughs> let's say they say you need to change the way something is happening on top of it and it's going to cost Shodin some more money then. Right, that's the flip side. And, and, and <laughs> so, so, so Shodin is a private developer in business to make a profit. So he knows the cost of the city parking garage is the city's. So, you know, he needs to minimize his costs while at the same time maybe not have as many concerns about our costs. We're hiring a consultant who has more concerns about our costs because they're watching out for us. It's, it's kind of that balance. Um, I would expect as part of good-natured cooperation between two parties, 
Both of us will have our consultants such that neither party does kind of what you portray the, wor portray the worst case scenario. So we don't suggest something that's going to cost him 500000 and he doesn't do something that's going to cost us 500000 That's the nature of these developments, especially if you're working hand in hand with a developer, is to both look out for your interests, but at the same time be respectful and, and both wanting to get to the end and, 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 and do the best possible product. I think to the other point of that, Gary, or to Mark's point, you know, if it does end up costing more, um, certainly there's going to be a lot of conversation between staff and this consultant as to whys and all this kind of stuff. But let's just say it did cost more than what was maybe thought, then it's going to cost more for a good reason. And if we don't have this consultant on board that's going to bring these good reasons to the forefront, it's going to end up costing us more down the road because of failure or maintenance. Right. So I think that's what's really important about getting this guy on board. You know, we, we use the example as the counting system. Because when you pull into a parking garage, there's nothing more frustrating of driving around, looking for a space, and finding there aren't any spaces. And modern parking garages all have a little sign outside which says, hey, there's 25 spaces available. And you know before you pull in there that there's 25 spaces available. Can anyone here, because I can't, tell me what brand of counting system mm -hmm. is the best counting system and what methodology do you use for a counting system? I have no idea. Walker does it all the time. That's another reason why we're hiring them is to be able to tell us this is the best, this is what you want. And so those are the types of day-to-day -day things that won't drive Scott Haynes nuts having to maintain the counting system every week. I can get you a 700-page book that'll tell you that, though. <laughs> <laughs> There are no other questions. Uh, someone like to make a motion to recommend to council resolution 17-76-R authorizing execution of a contract with Carl Walker Incorporated in the amount of $46,000 to provide parking consultant services for one Washington place parking structure. So moved. Second. Motion by Cerrone, second by Meitzler. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Consent? Yeah. I, <coughs> okay, we'll put it on a consent. <laughs> I can comment it after the consent agenda passes. Okay. But that was included in there, and it's for us to try to make sure that we get the best. Well, then let's put it on a regular agenda if you okay. want to talk about it. We'll put it on the regular agenda, because I think we should let the public know that we're trying to make this the best parking structure we can get. Yeah. Okay. All right, item 12, project status. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. I just have a few items to share with you. Um, just wanted to let you know that Evergreen, the uh, developer for the Campana project, has submitted their application for a permit. And um, our process is that internally we have a development review meeting. That development review meeting includes all of the various departments that will have to take a look at those plans and the then uh, the developer comes in to hear some comments back from staff so that they can respond to those comments and then they resubmit their application and it's at that point that it is then scheduled to come before plan commission for their review. <coughs> and so um, it will take a few weeks for us to look at those plans internally and schedule that development review meeting, estimate maybe early August, potentially, that um, would be the first time that it would go to the plant mission. And of course, that's gonna be a, a, a public meeting that anybody can attend and, and ask questions if they would like to. Um, we've also had the situation come up where we received a uh, liquor license application from a business owner who is uh, not a U.S. citizen but is a uh, resident alien status, so green card status, so able to stay in the United States for as long as they would want to. They have permission to work in the United States, but they just happen to maintain the citizenship from their country of origin. Not sure whether they're in the process of applying for US citizenship, but um, I was wondering if that was a requirement of the state of Illinois that somebody be a US citizen in order to be apply for a liquor license, and it is not. 
and then I looked at what other municipalities do, and it seems to be about 50-50 out there. Some of them say, you know, you have to provide proof of U.S. citizenship, but many others say um, the resident alien status is sufficient so long as you um, uh, submit along with your application a copy of your green card status. And meeting internally with the department heads today, we didn't see any reason why to uh, reject someone um, due to this status. And so just wanted to um, maybe get your sense of if you would be willing to entertain that as a possibility if we could submit a um, an amendment to our code that would allow that mm -hmm. is it you were looking specifically at this individual is there no we were just okay. uh because this individual did not have u.s citizenship okay. um we asked ourselves why do we have that requirement and we really couldn't come up with a good basis for why to distinguish between those two groups yeah, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't something that you looked specifically at this person and then somebody came up later that you looked specifically at and now we're in a tight spot. Right. Now, we would apply it know. equally to everyone, you know, if it, whether, you know, whomever came to apply, whether they were U.S. citizen or at least had that green card status, we would um, allow the, them to have satisfied that particular requirement, of course, um, with any... Uh, liquor license application there is uh, an extensive background check that is done on those those individuals so that would also be done in that case as well as an in-person interview with the liquor commissioner can I go back to the evergreen one yes. for our staff review of it since this is such a unique and multi-jurisdictional one Will we have any staff from any of the other entities as part of that review um, so that the Geneva School District has a say, or at least so that we have some idea um, what they're thinking that can be provided at the same time? Um, as a matter of fact, as part of that initial meeting that we had here, um, we have an email list of interested parties and we have created a special uh, web page that um, has all of this information, including everything that they submitted as part of their application has already been posted to that web page. And Anthony maintains the email list and has every time something new is added to that web page, He's notified them about it. Anytime that there's going to be a public meeting about the project, Anthony is going to specifically send out notice to that group. And I believe that um, members of the school district are on that list. But I think more importantly, I think after the last meeting, it was a we wanted to see um, us making sure that we were right from the very beginning working hand in hand. So. I, instead of just relying on an email list, are we having staff, our staff, reach out to their staff uh, as part of this phase of it or not yet? Are you thinking for planning purposes? No, no, no. For we're, where we're giving them feedback for our staff concerns is the way that I thought you had said what the, what the next step is from our staff with the developer. Right. We would not invite any other um, public entities to that internal meeting that we have with the developer that's um, for us to give them advice on fine-tuning their application so that they understand oftentimes people will make the mistake at just looking at the international building codes and they won't realize that we have some uh, special rules within our municipality and so we allow them the opportunity to learn that they've made some mistakes in their application so that they can correct those before they come before the plan commission Okay. Yeah, I just wasn't clear as to when their staff is going to be giving input and when with us so that we're all coordinating for maximum use of time. And mm -hmm. um, I think at the time of the public hearings or we could also schedule if there is a particular body that has like the school district um, to invite to have a joint meeting discussion about the project would probably be appropriate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just want to add on the conversation here, I've had the opportunity to talk with these folks several times, 
And I got to tell you, I have not to my satisfaction heard what I think is a sound plan for sidewalks surrounding that facility up there. I mean, I think there is a serious minus situation going on there about how much sidewalk Evergreen thinks they're going to be willing to build or not build. And as far as I'm concerned, the whole deal needs to have a real good understanding real quick up front as to what their responsibilities are going to be to build sidewalk. If anybody comes down here and tries to tell me that the idea is, well, these kids got to walk over to Western Avenue School, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to take them down to Fabian Parkway and we're going to walk them south into Batavia and then use the bike trail that it's there along Fabian Parkway out to Western Avenue. Then when we get to Western Avenue, we're going to walk them back across Fabian Parkway to, to the west side of the street so we can then walk them back across Western Avenue to get them to the east side of the street to get go up there and ride your car up there sometime and see how they're envisioning that sidewalk to be. I think we got some big problems here, and I don't know if we should be wasting our time with this or not if we don't have some people that are seriously interested in trying to safely walk those kids to school. I think that's why we ought to just send them some notice, and if they've got any input, they should be inputting just, just as early into this process so that those very concerns, I mean, I think at our meeting, it was clear that um, the project it's separate than itself there are some major concerns on council with safety issues and and my understanding is that the developer has met with the school district okay. directly all right okay so back to the liquor license yes idea. what's everybody think i mean I, I got just hearing about this now i got some mixed feelings on it but i guess my end of the day feeling is if the state law allows it mm -hmm. state law allows it mm -hmm. I just want to make sure there wasn't uh, some strong opposition certainly when it's on the um, committee of the whole agenda for your consideration there can be further deliberation about it as well I would certainly say I think it's something worth exploring because it may be a reoccurring situation we're getting a lot of restaurants in town we got two or three more that are on the doorstep or under construction right now and those will sell and the licenses will transfer and you know you've got all these folks in the United States here many of them carrying permanent visas and some of them may be the best cooks and the most honest people that are ever walking the earth and to just arbitrarily start saying we're well, not letting you have a license for some perceived technicality if it is a technicality I don't know I you know I think we should be uh, you know open on this one as far as where who we do the police department we have I think is quite capable of investigating and checking these people out to make sure we aren't getting somebody in here that's going to be problematic okay. all right there you go and the last thing is um, wanted to let you know that we have finally received the uh, recommendations from the law firm on the uh, Prairie State questions and so um, we will have an executive session to discuss those aspects of that conversation which are uh, attorney cl client privileged and thereafter we will have um, a, a summary to present to the public about the results of that any idea on when that's going to be um, the uh, discussion will be at the very next the executive session will be at the next cow meeting and then um, pursuant to uh, your direction to allow me to release the um, summary, the public summary, then um, that could be released at the following city council meeting. All right, that it? Laura? Yes. Okay, any others? Anybody have another? No. Just one quick one for me. I'm sorry, Lucy, go ahead. I'm going to share your news. Susan just showed me that there Use was... The mic. Susan just pointed out that there was some sort of accident between um, a vehicle and two bikes on the corner of McKee and 31. Minor injuries. But it happened. That happened. It was minor injuries. It's good that they're minor. Right. But... 
I just think we need to really consider looking at that area. I, you know, this is two weeks in a row that this particular route has um, had some sort of incident. Can, can I give an update on uh, where things stand with regard to our conversations with the Illinois Department of Transportation? Yeah. Um, as you know, several staff members went to the Illinois Department of Transportation's offices in Schaumburg, Illinois last fall. The purpose of those discussions were to um, talk specifically about the pedestrian crossings on 31 and um, number one, request the right to use the hawk signal, which is the uh, red flashing signal over the roadway. Um, and the basis of that is because it has been ingrained in us that yellow means slow down, but red means stop. And the state of Illinois is one of the few states that does not allow the hawk system over the roadway. Um, and so uh, the result of our request for the hawk signal, they told us that they were studying the hawk signal and that they would consider if in the future they deemed that that was um, a safe method of marking these types of crossings that they would consider our request to be one of the first municipalities to be able to put that into to test. Um, however, there has been no progress on that. We also submitted a plan to them that complied with the existing regulations that would increase, they, it would put an arm over the road with the yellow flashing light as opposed to the flashing lights merely being on the sign on the side of the road. And then 250 feet before that area, there would also be a flashing yellow that would catch people's eye and give them more time to process the fact that they're gonna be coming up to a pedestrian crossing. We have made numerous attempts to contact the state of uh, the IDOT by email, by telephone, and have received no response on an, improve, an approval for that. Just one little correction. The supplemental installation of additional flashing yellow signs in the overhead, that is a pending recommendation from like the FHWA to, to study that and approve that okay. and that's why we need to we need IDOT's blessing in order to proceed forward with its installation okay so that that's that's what that is and IDOT won't IDOT we can't just go and install it because it's an IDOT roadway uh actually I have a, a noticed I think it was today or yesterday as I was traveling north on 31 uh that very signal uh someone had had uh activated it and I noticed that the the signal on the east side was activated, but the the light on the west side was not working. And I don't know, is that supposed, is it supposed to be working I on both sides? I was watching it tonight, actually. It was, it was working tonight. I was just happened to be watching it tonight as I'm sitting in traffic waiting to come to City Hall, and I, I, was, I was seeing both of them. So I know they're both working as of tonight. Yes, when someone presses the button, both the east and west sides oh, should yeah. be activated. Because to me, it seems to, it, it was not working. Because I, I noticed that that's, that's odd. So it may be. We'll just test it and make sure. Yeah, I just should can't help but still believe that so much of this has to do with um, pedestrian um, education because I really think that many people, <coughs> and I see it happen all the time in front of Faltos, and even mm -hmm. on, on 25, people push the button, it starts to flash, and they just walk out in front of cars. There is a certain element of common sense that has to come into play that unless the cars are stopping, you better not step out in front of them. And, uh, you know, I... You're in a catch-22 in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. If you don't step out, cars don't have to stop. Right. But if you do step out and the cars don't stop, then... Then you get <laughs> crunched. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, the law says within the crosswalk. And so, you know, I think it, it, it is meant to mean that if you've made it safely halfway across, the people coming the other way are supposed to stop because you're within the crosswalk. Yes. But it's, it just doesn't work. And, and I see people just like randomly walk out in front of cars and learning how to cross the street is like a fundamental thing you learn when you're a child. And it, it, I, I don't know how to educate people to but not walk in front of cars. This particular intersection? Mm -hmm. 
there are four lanes make it difficult because yes. there are bl oh, I, blind spots. I there. totally understand. So you that. may get across, and all of a sudden a car is coming that doesn't see you. So it's different than crossing a two-lane road oh, on Wilson. I, I, no, I totally get and, it. And this is part of the problem. It's the whole thing, and then you're bringing the people down on the sidewalk in front of many driveways and a commercial building. So this is, isn't just the flashing light issue. It's the whole area, and it's it's important because it's what connects to the river paths. I mean, this is just a major, and it's just continuing to increase traffic through this area as more people come to the area. You know, I, at some point, we should look at it again. I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that everyone here feels that way, but we've had two, three accidents. Or I, I agree minor. we should look at it again, because, I mean, and especially if you note the fact that that's the only place on 31 north of Wilson that you're paint striped for a crosswalk, and there's no light obviously north of that until you get to Fabian. And that's a hard crossing. So I, I think if we're going to continue to have some sort of marking for a cross there, then yeah, we probably need to look at that in some way. But I, I and I, I, I don't have a problem with looking at it, but I question again where we're going with this other than digging a hole, you know. If well, somebody gets hurt going across that intersection, are we insured? We're, we're addressing this issue and all this. It kind of reminds me of the dam the conversation. Idea. And let me finish. And just the other day, I think it was Saturday or Sunday, I happened to be coming down McKee Street, heading west towards that intersection, and there were 12 bicyclists in front of me. And they got to Lincoln Street, and they turned south, and they went to Houston Street, and they crossed at Houston Street. Which they still do. Of course, without stopping at the stop mm -hmm. sign. <laughs> um, so, I mean, no matter how well you try to signalize and do what I... I, I don't know what the answer is. Houston. Look at it, I and guess, but I don't know what the, the answer is. The proprietors that are on that corner. I mean, people, it's easier to cross at Houston. So we have two dangerous intersections at this point. The idea is to make our town better. I agree. And so, and it's a good amenity. This isn't rocket scientists. Other towns have mastered safe crossings for bicycles and pedestrians. We just haven't done it yet. Yeah. So getting across... Batavia from east to west is treacherous. Yeah. I just have a, I mean, another option that we should consider is if the public isn't going to learn and, and you can't educate them, there's a willing unwillingness to, and drivers are not willing to, and the state's not willing to put in a red light there. Mm -hmm. If we don't want to see somebody killed, another alternative is to remove it mm -hmm. from that intersection. Now, that might not be an uh, an acceptable for um, for the way it was studied for the biking community but if that is a problem mm -hmm. and we're seeing that nope people aren't learning nope we're not going to be able to get the red lights which we know that it needs then to prevent somebody from getting killed nobody got killed before nobody was having accidents there before we put the flashers there maybe the proximate cause for this is the flashers now at that intersection I just, and, I'd like to add, though, that that was not, the biking community never supported that. That was something that we as a council just right. went ahead and did. This was not, the biking community was against it. That one came as being approved before I got on. No. no. That, one, that one actually wasn't. That one actually was only a creation of council's decision not to install the Center Island at Houston Street and the crossing at Houston Street. I thought that was all part of it. No. Well, an installing the Center Island at Houston Street is not going to stop. Correct. What happens right. out there when you have one car in the inside lane and another car flies by in the outside lane and doesn't stop. But at so least you had that don't place. Don't kid yourself but that you that's had a stop. place to rest in the it's middle, and you did before. But yeah, but it's it's worse now. Well, then the reason and the problem that that's a problem is going across four lanes of traffic. And for IDOT to say that they don't allow crosswalks on four lanes of traffic is a lie. Because if you go up to Route 38, there's seven of them yeah. between the river and 7th Street that go across at least four lanes of traffic. But they're not signalized, and you have to watch your traffic because I've crossed in front of the um, El, El Toto Padre, however, whatever the name of that restaurant is, and there's a crosswalk right there. At 4th but, Street or exactly. There's no signal, Street. so you have to pay attention to the <clears throat> right. cars. There's a crosswalk. It's striped. I can right. cross all day long, but I better not walk out in front of a car. Mm -hmm. well, well, to Lucy's point, though, it is an issue. What we got going on there is an issue. Mm -hmm. It probably needs to be looked at. I don't know how, 
Um, it's just Gary and Laura and I, and I think the mayor was included in this about three, four months ago. I had a resident down in the seventh ward that got a hold of me that said that their, her and her neighbors were concerned about Millview Drive, where it, it that ends into the Tavy Avenue Route 31 at that point. And she saw, you know, to get kids across into the park mm -hmm. is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And this conversation has been brought up many times throughout the years where there should be a hawk put there, there should be something put there. And IDOT's never allowed anything. Right. And Gary, Laura, whomever, all, I forget it's been three months now, but everybody's been trying to work with IDOT on it. And again, nowhere's the police department did some study on it and you know how many incidences have been there. And, and it, just, it, it just really, it's one of those things where we all recognize there's a problem, but you can't get anything done about it. Mm -hmm. I recommend it to the homeowner and I believe she's gonna do it. Um, Cause she's, you know, of course she's still concerned about it. And well, what can we do? What can we do? And I said, the only thing I can think you can do at this point is get all your neighbors to sign a petition and come down here and present it to the city council and ask that the city council present it to IDOT. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, if you're not comfortable doing that, I'll present it to the city council on your behalf. And the last communication I had with her was she thought they were gonna go ahead and do that and I haven't heard anything more from her. Whether or not that would go anywhere, I have no idea. But like, I think it was Michael Bryan that said about the median in the middle of Houston Street and Batavia Avenue, was you know if you get 25 kids to go marching in the night out with baby strollers and say we don't think this is safe to cross here they might pay more attention to you than a phone call that's a good so point. you know I, both those both those intersections i think are an issue they are we we there were that many people concerned about that at the time i don't know if they could be rallied again but i think that um to dave's point it went the other way too, because I do remember Steve Hieronymus talking about how it wasn't safe for um, anyone who's in a wheelchair to be able to cross yeah. and, and stop at that island. So I mean, it, we, we had this both either. we had both uh, viewpoints uh, covered in that. And honestly, I mean, I I think it's you know we've gone from being a very car centric society to now we are promoting walkability and bikeability, mm -hmm. and so there's a change in mindset. And so. Um, there's an education process that doesn't seem to be happening and I see cars randomly stop at the crosswalk that's here at the bottom of the hill on Wilson Street to let people cross when there's no flashing light they just happen to see that there's a crosswalk there so there and someone's waiting to cross so they just stop and you're like wait why are you stopping in the middle of the street when people just should know how to cross the street these are those random things that um, I watch and as I'm driving through town and think Something's not right here, and I'm not sure what it is. Gary, if the consensus of the council was that they'd like you to look like to have some more study done of this or consideration, what would the next step be? I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I know. Taking two steps, three steps, four steps back. We've already been told by IDOT on multiple occasions that the flashing, any sort of flashing beacon cannot be closer to Wilson Street than it currently is at McKee. So if we want to do any sort of crossing at Houston Street, it cannot involve any type of flashing device or, or, or short of a full-blown traffic signal, they wouldn't consider it. Um, from an engineering standpoint, I mean, IDOT is like, a, like an ocean freighter that, that doesn't turn on a dime. It's slow to, slow to move, <laughs> slow to turn, slow to change course. A road diet would never be approved by IDOT by purely on, based on the ADTs, the, the traffic that we have, okay? But the road diet that was done in Geneva, and the reason why it was done that way in Geneva was because IDOT's still skeptical that it will work, and they want to be able to go back to four lanes at some point in the future if, if they ever want to. So they didn't allow them to do a permanent median up there. But a road diet solves a lot of the issues, not all of them, but a lot of the issues we're talking about tonight because it forces traffic into one northbound lane, one southbound lane that pedestrians then would have to cross with a Jersey suicide lane in the middle that would provide plenty of space for refuge. Um, so that's one option. One option is a road diet, literally from Fabian Parkway to you know, Moose Heart Road. And, and, and you guys all drive that road every day. I drive that road every day. Frankly, I'm not convinced that the ADT is such that a road diet wouldn't work. Should, would there be times where we sit in the lane a little bit later in traffic going through intersections? Yeah, probably, but is that the end of the world when you're considering other factors? Probably not. So a road diet, but that would take a big political push because IDOT rules will all say you can't do it. So IDOT's going to have to be convinced politically in order to be able to do it. 
we could investigate the Hawk system. The Hawk system at McKee will never be allowed because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's too close to Wilson Street, and IDOT views the Hawk system as in District One at least. IDOT views it as a traffic signal which is unlit. And what are we supposed to do? We're all taught when we're 16 years old when you approach a traffic signal that's unlit, you got to stop. You got to treat it like a four-way stop. That's how IDOT views Hawk systems. Other states don't view it that way. Other districts don't view it that way. But IDOT District One does. So they won't, that's why they didn't want the Hawk system down at Millview, for, for that reason. Um, to answer your question, I, I, there, we're running out of options, okay? That's how I think, to a certain extent, they ended up with the refuge island at, at Houston Street, because it was probably the, the best of a lot of bad options. And when that option was then, you know, cast away, we went on to another best of the bad options. My recommendation and the recommendation staff has had is if we're going to keep the flashers at, at McKee, which probably in some ways do give people a false sense of security, let's pursue getting the overhead flashers up there so that those inside cars can now have a visual and see and they won't be in a blind spot anymore because the, the outside lanes block the flashers from the inside car. This way they can actually see it. And let's put additional flashers 250 feet down the road so that you're giving even more fair warning. We've already done signage. And let's do, we've already talked about BATV. BATV can be our friend in this thing where we have, you know. PSAs. A, you know, public service announcement. You know, Chris, Chris the crossing guard, you know, out there and teach people how to cross. I mean, little things like that that will teach kids from, from you know, grade school to, to, to the elderly what's a safe way to do it. Don't press the button and jump out. You know, you got to be cautious. I go through one of these every week in downtown Oswego. Oswego has an installation in District 2 that would never be allowed in District 1. But, I mean, I'm very cautious. I press the button, I look both ways, and I wait. I wait. I'm one of those people that waits for a gap in traffic before I even press the button. Because, I, I mean, then once I, once, because that way the traffic is far away away, they see the lights, and then they see me standing out there, and I'm 6 foot 10, I'm hard to miss. But, I mean, it, <laughs> I, I, you know, that's how people should be doing it, but they don't. We all know they don't. They wait, they'll press the button in the middle of traffic and expect traffic to stop. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. Sorry, I rambled. Oh, that's good. Rambling if, is good. If you were talking about the overhead for flashing yellows, would they be flashing all the time then? No, they would not. They'd only be activated when the people press the button. So the, the, the flashing yellow that exists on the side of the road today, picture that same assembly overhead at the center of the road, mm -hmm. picture that same assembly 250 feet down the road. So now you would have three sets of flashing yellow lights flashing at you as you're going southbound or north, mm -hmm. northbound. So, but going with that theory, how would you know then that the overhead light being out, does it contain a yellow light or does it contain a red light? Because when the people press the button, it, it flashes yellow, flashes red, and IDOT, IDOT will but not if, allow it to flash red. But if red. you don't know that, then you could think that it's, it's a, a It's a yellow sign. The signs that are out there today okay. are yellow. All right. Yeah, yeah the, they're yellow with yellow flash, yeah. yellow beacons below them yeah. that, are, that are not lit normally. All right, I'm thinking a another circular light above yeah no this is this would be a triangular shaped sign which has the pedestrian symbol in it just tell everyone as you're approaching there's a pedestrian crosswalk there lights aren't lit up so i know i can just go through but pedestrian crosswalk now the lights are lit up and i'm a car i'm saying whoa the lights are lit up that means there's a pedestrian here i need to, to be cautious okay mr mayor you had an opinion about the uh road diet didn't you that well we we i went into chicago and asked them and, and gary and i got a letter back from them basically saying that the number south of Fabian Parkway exceeded by some fairly high number yeah. the, the requirement of with them allowing road diets so that we shouldn't even ask the question because we have too much traffic on Route 31 uh, in Batavia. And how did Geneva get away with it? Because it was below. Their ADTs north of Fabian are surprisingly lower than they are south of Fabian. Yep. I do think there'd be political support for it though. Um, there are a couple other issues. Um, we still have an ordinance that says you can't ride bikes on sidewalks. So that's a little confusing. And it seems like, I mean, the path on McKees, I mean, going south on um, Route 31 that we're using as a bike path really isn't a bike path. It's a sidewalk. And that would probably, if we're improving the crossing, should also be improved to be widened and somehow signs made so people know. 
on the driveway so that Staff had already that. presented that at one time. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good idea. It was told not to, not to pursue it. And, and there are provisions in our ordinance, and Daniel would have to comment on this. There are provisions in our ordinance who allow certain people to ride on, and mostly small children, to ride on sidewalks. I know, but it's just certain, confusing to a lot of people. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the bridge option and the underground option that other communities have done. Yeah, um, coming from Wooddale. I mean, Wooddale had to cross Irving Park Road. Eventually, Wooddale decided that they were going to do a pedestrian crossing, which is what they ended up doing. Now, you need space for that. They happen to have a right. ComEd corridor going through the Irving Park Road, so they were able to work with ComEd and a nice large corridor in order to get a pedestrian crossing. That doesn't exist at McKee Street. Mm -hmm. The but tunnel. Maybe, maybe at another a tunnel or another location. Yeah. I don't know. There just needs to be some location that connects. Right. Gary, you reminded me of one of the maddening things about the last discussion was when we say IDOT wouldn't allow it, but then District 1 IDOT would allow something, but <laughs> District 2 IDOT. So why do we have different rules within IDOT depending on the districts that you're in? And why is there, if they're talking about standardization why is there no standardization from the ones that are supposed to be doing standardization even amongst their own districts that's a i mean i, I started as a professional engineer in the state of illinois in 1993 and i don't think that question's been addressed yet so i mean well the different one, districts and i and district one has always been its own animal district ever since my career again since 93 district one has been its own animal district one is metropolitan chicagoland five million people versus District 5 or District 2 where I live, which is you know rural Illinois, and, and, and you're dealing with completely different standards and different, different, I mean, there's different expectations from people. So, so in a lot of ways, District 1 has had their own standards forever. I mean, ever since I was a design engineer working for a consultant downtown Chicago, District 1 had different standards than our project out in Lacombe, Illinois. Totally different standards. But they're all under one department, and maybe if we didn't have different budgets for different fiefdoms, maybe it wouldn't be. Okay. You know, just really quickly, just to. Not going anywhere with this. Yeah, but. just, it's kind of a tangent off of this, because Lucy, you talked about the speed limit coming in from Fabian, that it drops. One thing, and I'm guessing IDOT doesn't allow this because of everything you're saying right now, and I don't remember what state it was in, Utah, Colorado, whatever, as I was approaching towns, they had an electronic speed limit sign with the, or a speed limit sign with the radar, and it was electronic, and it was flashing at you, mm -hmm. the, like a white flashing light, so you knew that it was obvious you were going over the speed limit. Is that something that is allowed? Because I think speed along that road would help mitigate some of the issues as well, because mm -hmm. living right there, I know people are flying past my yeah. house. I, I can speak to that. Yeah. We do have a um, speed detection. No, I know we have detection. that. It doesn't, this was like a strobe that if I was going 36 and a 35, it's still strobing at me. And as soon as I dropped to 35, then nothing happened. It just okay. showed that I was going 35. So it was, it was a much better visual reminder. It's permitted as a permanent installation on Route 34 in Oswego. <laughs> Kane and Rahat may be able to tell whether it's permitted in, in District 1 or not. We, I don't know if it if Caneville, Caneville has one. What's that? On Main, on Main Street, Caneville has one as you go into Caneville. Caneville's outside of the flash one, too. Yeah. But is it, so it's like? It's a, it's a, I don't know if it's a strobe, but it's a flashing like LED yellow. Mm -hmm. I know, because I was. I'll follow up, and we can follow up to see yeah. if that's a permitted use. Isn't there in, in one of those up north on Randall, up in St. Charles, as you're going north? In the county road? Either up or down the hill. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're yeah. right. I think there's. How about a traffic circle? Yes. How about we move on? <laughs> How about, uh, does anybody have any other others? There is a house floor, if you could just check for me with, with Rhonda maybe, and it's probably already on her radar, but Kitty Corner from the Elm restaurant on Main Street. It's in next, the county. Yeah, I know it is. Township. But is there anything that we can ask the county to do we've about already, that? We've already done it. I thought we probably had. Okay. <laughs> anybody got anything else? Got, no? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Silvati. Second. Second. Second by Kellyanne. All in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourn.